<laughs> have you guys ever done um, isolation? I wasn't images, but I would <laughs> love to do an isolation tank. So you float suspended uh, in this yeah. tank, and it's completely pitch black. Uh, and you sit there and you just float and you stare at the How ceiling. How long is this? Uh, you, I went for 90 minutes. That's why I want to like get checked out before I do that because yeah. I don't know what's going to happen in those 90 minutes. <laughs> I will be left with all of my thoughts. I'll just be like, no. fuck, I have the winning no. strategy for this case and I have nothing to write it down yeah, with. That's what I would do. I would sit there for 90 minutes and think about work. They would be like, you wrote down some memo to yourself in your blood on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like, I wouldn't have forgotten if I had it. Yeah. It's important. That's yeah. depressing to me that like... I don't know. I think that's a very American thing where it's like, yep, we're constantly thinking all the time about everything, and it's terrifying. The idea of not doing that is horrifying yeah. and scary. Like, hey, Noah, do you know what time it is? What time is it, Steven? It is time to talk about death and taxes. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard the theme songs? Guys, welcome to Let's Talk About Death and Taxes. On this show, we do the thing that is in the title of the thing, uh, which is we talk about death and taxes. Uh, the thing that Ben Franklin said was inevitable. I think that's where the quote comes from, right? Sure. Right? That was Sounds the, right. Sounds to, right. Yeah. Ben Franklin <laughs> It's like cool. a good guy to attribute the quote to. <laughs> I mean, there's ever a quote and you're not sure where it came from, you can attribute it to Ben Franklin. Exactly. Or, or Gandhi. Winston Churchill. And Nelson Mandela. Gandhi. Thomas. There's like, there's like five people. There's that a couple. Can Sometimes, G if you're in a real panning, maybe Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Jesus once said, oh boy, yeah, like, that's dangerous territory. My grandma would get mad if I got that wrong. Um, Cool. These guys are lawyers and I am an idiot. Uh, So it's fun. It's like we, I learn from them and they like hold my hand and walk me down knowledge lanes about things that I've never heard of before. Um, so can you guys explain some of your qualifications quick at the top here so people should know why to listen to you? <laughs> okay. I am Steven Schreiber. I like long walks on the beach, <laughs> but I am an attorney and the owner of um, Schreiber Law Group. Um, we are, we have, we're in a state planning and probate law firm in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I've been doing this for It'll be nine years in November that we'll be an attorney, um, but we've had the firm for several years and we've been working with clients to make sure that they have their ship protected. And my name is James Champlin. I also like long walks on the beach. <laughs> uh, I've been an attorney for about eight years. Um, prior to this, I have worked in criminal defense and also in some legal aid doing domestic violence related work. Gotcha. Sweet. Um, yeah, and they won't say it, but they've all gone. Stephen went to Duke. Which law school did you go to? I, don't I know. went to Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yeah. See, he gets by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to Duke, a tech school. Duke's football <laughs> team is now like I think we're zero and three, maybe zero and two. I one of those was a Notre Dame victory. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Duke's football team showed up. Let me know how basketball starts. <laughs> there were people there. I saw. Technically. Yeah. <laughs> Um, guys, on today's episode, we are talking about teachers. Um, we have read, we've been doing some, uh, like we've been reading news headlines on this show, and we've I've seen a lot of news headlines about how teachers are um, going back to work, and everybody's terrified of coronavirus. My mom's a teacher, and like it's really, really scary and awful. Um, and I've read a lot of things about how teachers are like thinking about getting wills um, and last will and testaments and that sort of thing. So I was like, let's do a whole episode on teachers. It'll be fun. I like teachers. I almost was a teacher. Steven was a teacher. I was a teacher. And I almost was a teacher. Really? Yeah. Cool. My husband was a teacher. He was he taught for longer than I did. What would have you taught? I was set to go teach second graders wow. at a school in Jackson, Mississippi. Cool. Oh, I taught in Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah. Um, but I decided to go to law school instead. Yeah. I the school I taught had in Jackson. I taught one year in Jackson and then I had a falling out with my admin and moved to a school near Memphis where I had another falling out with my admin. I'm not a great teacher. I'm way too willful to be a teacher. <laughs> but, uh, well, what's fun is I, I felt a little guilty about backing out and not doing the teacher thing, but I thought, you know, I, I just want to go through law school and, and do some like legal aid to start and that's where I'll do my good because this was through like a, like a Teacher America type program mm -hmm. and I felt really guilty for backing out, but then I found out later from a friend in the program that the guy they brought in to take my place had actually married another teacher in the program. So Ooh. if I hadn't backed out. You were part of the romantic comedy. This marriage, I'm part of their meet cute. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I felt better. There you go. Yeah. You made a marriage happen by doing the opposite of by not, taking By not showing up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I'm sure there's a couple marriages out there that I made happen by not showing up. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I mean, I'm, I'm still decompressing my teaching career with my therapist like over a decade later. <laughs> like, Fantastic. Um, guys, on this show, we answer questions about estate planning um, and probate issues and other things related to death taxes. Um, also, we have started to talk about like criminal stuff too, which I think makes the podcast a lot more fun. Um, but yeah, so so uh, the, here's how it's going to work here. We've got some questions from teachers. We've got some video questions because we're fancy. We live in the 20th century, 21st century, actually. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes, 21st, correct. Yes, gotcha. Okay. Dan, okay. Um, <laughs> we have no flying cars. Yes, no flying cars. Yes. Um, so the first question comes from my buddy named Pat. Hello, my name is Pat. Uh, the students I work with call me the greatest. I'm actually a special education teacher at Geneva High School. Now that my brother is officially my beneficiary, will he be able to collect my pension if I pass away before I'm done working? Or does he have to wait a certain time period? Thank you so much and have a great day. Okay. I love Pat. Pat. I love his hair. Pat's the best. Great hair. (laughs) Great beard. Pat used to wrestle. He used to be like a, like a, I don't know if it's pro, but I think he got paid and like he would like wrestle and stuff. And then I met him through improv. He's a really cool guy. Like Greco Roman or like the fun, no, like like the fun wrestling. Like, like I'm the, I'm the Undertaker, that sort of thing. Okay. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I think Undertaker's already taken. Yeah. He probably went by something else. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. But to answer his question, um, so in most states, um, once he's Invested in this pension program, um, which when I was a teacher, I think I had to teach for four or five years to be a BSA employee for like some period of time to get vested in the retirement system, and then it would pass to his beneficiary. At least the vested amount um, would still pass through the estate, and that would actually not be through probate. That would just go literally to them in either a check or the distribution. But it's unlikely that a sibling would be able to kind of get the monthly payments as if he had done the teaching career himself. I think most states would restrict that to the spouse. Okay. So that was my question. I was kind of, when I was doing research for the episode and like researching questions and stuff, I was kind of surprised because I don't think I understand how pensions work. So I was wondering if I could bug you about that. Oh yeah. So this is a ruin it. We don't have a pension. No, no, I know. (laughs) (laughs) No, I know. Very few. (laughs) Pensions now are are almost done. They don't do them anymore. But teachers, unlike everyone else, they do have a pension plan. Um, I know when my husband was teaching, he, they had like TRS instead of social security. Um, but a lot of them have pension pro. When I was a teacher in Mississippi, we had a PERS, the public employee retirement system, whatever that was. But you would contribute, uh, you would contribute, contribute, they would take out of your paycheck a set <laughs> amount of money. Um, and then it would sit in your, like your investment account. Um, and then if it hit a certain, you toss a certain amount of time, it would vest. And then if you hit a certain other threshold, then you'd be entitled to payments upon your retirement. So the fun thing for teachers is, is that t- the matter of your payout at the end is tied to your usually at the last three years or so of, of your, your income. income. Whatever yeah. your highest pay is. Yeah, so the fun thing, a lot of times you'll see a teacher go 17 years as a teacher, then jump up to admin to get a raise, Yeah, and yeah. do that and for three retire. years, and peace out. Yep. When I was in Mississippi, a lot of times people would teach 20 years. I started teaching when I was 22, so I could have taught 20 years when you max out the pay scale, retire, move across the state line, teach... The 20 years there, then called a career and get two pensions, which mm-hmm. you are allowed to do. Wow. You, yeah. you, you have enough time to get vested twice. <laughs> cool. So let me let me ask some clarifying questions here. So a 401k and a retirement account is money that I squirrel away. And then yeah, 401ks some... are private. Gotcha. So that's your money. Technically, you can, you can do whatever you want with it. A pension works more like Social Security, where basically in this industry, everyone in this district is going to pay into the same pool. Um, and then this pool, like when I pay into it, that money is going out to the people who are retired right now, receiving the pension money. And then eventually, it kind of relies on the trust that this system will last for years and years and years. To, mm-hmm. s- to some degree, the idea, hopefully, behind the pension is that it's properly funded. And so... Is not that's like Social Security when when I pay, when we pay FICA and Social Security it goes out to current beneficiaries. The hope of a well-run pension plan is that all the money stays in the principal and that it throws off the income to retirees. That's not really happening in any state because they've been right. 
fucking the calculations up. And honestly, that's terrifying. I have v mm -hmm. many, many, many concerns for teachers and other public workers that their pension plans will go bankrupt. Um, Jesus. Illinois flirted with public sector worker their pension plans go defaulting right several times it might they might still be flirting with it states will keep flirting with it for a while and i think covid 19's probably accelerated that as a lot of re their inflow of revenue may have slowed down and they might be and politicians might be tempted to alter the books to make it look mm -hmm. like their funds are solvent when they really aren't yeah. Well, and I think a lot of it is going to change a little bit in the future because I know a lot of the more modern pension calculations work in Social Security payments, um, whereas a lot of these prior ones, you know, I would, I would, you know, when I would, when I was practicing in Chicago, I would talk with older public workers who had these like old school pensions, and when they retired, they were going to start making more money than, than they currently wow. made. I mean, significantly more money. That sounds um, great. It, it sounds great, <laughs> but, it's great, but for the it's great for the person who's retiring, and right. it sucks for everybody else. The system wasn't right. des no. yeah. The system was not des well. It theoretically, was designed for that yeah. at the beginning, but then mm -hmm. all the intervening events like recessions and trying to make money work ruined right. the ability of it to actually pay out. Gotcha. Right. So, so here's my follow up question. Um, because Pat, just, just to get back to both Pat. parties sucked on that. But yeah. Pat, so Pat to get back to Pat's question. Yes. So let me let me clarify something that I didn't understand. So let's say Pat. I love Pat, but let's say he gets in a terrible wrestling accident and he passes away. I love Pat. Pat never re passed away. I love you, dude. <laughs> but um, so cool. So now he's paid into. Let's say he works for thirty years and then something terrible happens. Yeah. Um, he's paid into this system for thirty years. Does his brother get? Pat's pension. Oh, yeah. So typically what will happen, so the pension itself depends on when he dies, but there is a cash component in most, in many states of it. Like when I was a teacher, I quit teaching. I bought a house. I withdrew all the money I contributed to my pension um, and use it for my down payment. Cool. Okay. So, so that segment of it is often withdrawable for the beneficiaries of the estate, but the actual retiree payments usually aren't. But if Pat got married his spouse could in many states receive the actual payments as working but there's probably going to be a cash component to it that um his brother would be able to claim cool that's super interesting i did not know that so it's pretty much like a, a, any old retirement account yeah it's, it's more like an ira in that regard yeah not, not not completely because ira you can have you can you can designate the income to flow differently it's more restrictive but you can actually pull out probably more cash mm -hmm. um Cool. So, do we answer his question? Does his brother? And and if and if and I don't specialize in retirement plans necessarily, yeah. so I can bring in an ERISA attorney to <laughs> really clarify it, and you will. It will be both informative and surprisingly boring. <laughs> <laughs> to answer to answer Pat's question, though, he could make a will or a trust, though, yeah. that involves so, this in so some way. He could do that, um, okay. but if he leaves it as it is, his brother would probably get some sort of cash amount. Sweet. Right. Very cool. Okay, great. Um, that brings us on to the next part here. I don't know what we're gonna do next. Let's figure out something cool. Um, okay, great. Let's jump to um, let's watch this Mark Rober video because the the part of the reason why I wanted to do this is because the the thought of we're gonna watch an ad really quick. Um, sorry about that. I need to get YouTube Premium. You did. <laughs> I can add you to my family. <laughs> oh my god, please, really? Oh my god. I still have like four more members or something left. That sounds amazing. Um, but yeah, okay, so so I saw this video. Um, Mark Rober, science YouTuber out there. Um, we're gonna play, I hope he doesn't sue us or you know copyright claim this because we're gonna play a minute we'll of plug his thing. him. Exactly. Um, Follow Mark <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure Mark Rober really appreciates our plug. <laughs> This video has now 17 owes, million like, views. Now Finally. He owes, now he owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, suck um, on that, Mark. But I just thought this video was really, really illustrative of like, okay, hey, you know, you have you have 20 children in a in a room, right? Yeah. And they all are little variables that you can't control, and they have hands that go everywhere. And they're all disgusting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, they're all very sweet, but usually disgusting. Yeah, and so this video is cool. He... I've always thought if we could somehow just see the germs around us, everyone would be a lot more careful and we'd get sick way less. Unfortunately, that's still not possible. So I did the next best thing by running a day long experiment in this third grade classroom. I found this powder called glow germ and just like real germs, when it's on your hands, you can't see it. 
But unlike real germs, if you turn a black light on, it becomes visible. But it transfers to things you've touched, so it provides a really good way to visualize exactly how germs spread. So before the kids arrived, as a control, I went around and noted any pre-existing spots in the room that fluoresced under the black light, and then it was go time. The kids, of course, had no idea what we were doing and that the teacher had been secretly infected with the glowing powder. So she randomly shook the hands of three kids, but didn't touch any of the rest. And so with that, they just went about their normal day. At break, I did choose one random student and he agreed to let me put some of the powder on his hands too. And then two hours later at lunchtime, I checked the results. Remember, everything you see here started with just the teacher and one student having a little of that powder on their hands. And because my flashlight can only illuminate one spot at a time, I use Photoshop to better visualize our observations of where germs were left behind, including on the other kids. Uh-oh, <laughs> we're pretty hot over here. Oh, right here. And they were actually pretty diligent about washing their hands. This was the desk of the kid that was infected. And what's crazy is that germs could live on a hard surface like this for up to nine days. And so you can see how important it is to disinfect the things a sick person regularly touches. For example, this was the phone of the teacher in the experiment. Even if you wash your hands really often, if you immediately pull out your phone, a lot of those germs just go right back on your hands. Think about when the last time was that you cleaned your phone. I just thought that was super interesting, right? I need two things. I need that germ powder and I need a dark, well, no, dark <laughs> a black light. light. Black <laughs> light. <laughs> so that we can do it in the office and see like what what happens. Um um yeah, no, I just thought that was like I think that is one of the most illustrative examples of like hey, this is like an unbeatable problem in my opinion like children being children yes, yeah we've, we've planned our public safety around the behavior of children yes yeah. and it's terrifying and there's and like i don't know and and you know i i listen to my mom and she's telling me that they have all these safety regulations you know the kids are sitting six feet apart and they only have half the kids in the building at one time um and hazmat suits they're great <laughs> I think it's fun to write astronauts. But I mean, and they, they do have like dividers and everything. And, and all of these districts have these these things in place that are basically trying to, um, you know, mitigate the spread of this virus. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, like he, he goes on later in the video and talks about like the, the frequency in which people touch their face. Right. And he says that um, even if you tell someone, hey, don't touch your face. The first thing they do is touch their face when they don't. Well, think now you've about planted it. that seed. Exactly. I'm, I have to try really hard right now. Not. You're right now. I'm literally like I'm clenching the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like everybody, the, everybody, do a quick scratch, so really quick. No, the no. press conference where the lady was like, "Don't touch your face." Oh, and then she like licked her finger. <laughs> yeah, like turn ten the seconds later. It's like Ugh. I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. That would be all I would be doing is not. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's been something that's been beneficial about wearing a mask is I'm touching my face a lot less because I have a mask over. It's it. good for your skin. Um, yeah, uh, no, I definitely believe that. A lot of no, acne and no. outbreaks are caused by skin, skin touching. Skin touching. Yeah. Mm, um, I don't know. I had I had two questions about that video in this segment here. Um, if you were a teacher right now, what creative things would you do to stop your children from spreading germs? I'd retire. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I mean, I would have been, I'm yeah. borderline at teaching anyway. I feel really. Okay, when people say teaching is a calling, that's like code for we're going to treat you badly for less money than you could get on the marketplace because you really have a calling to be treated badly. Yeah. But um no, I mean but yeah, honestly, it's but, but realistically if I was uh if I was like I'm going to see this through. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess beyond face mask, I probably would have like a gazillion gloves and I might wear a hazmat suit every day, partly because <laughs> I think the kids would think it was fun. <laughs> like, I guess that depends on the age that you're teaching. Like little kids would probably find it entertaining or like an astronaut suit. Well, once you get past like, that threshold where it's not scary anymore. Now you're weird. Yeah. Yeah. Now, like, oh, you're weird. That's fine. You'll be somewhat, you better be yeah. a great teacher because now you're going to be the weirdo. <laughs> mm, so you'll be like, mm. does anyone remember Mr. So and so? Yeah, the <laughs> astronaut guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For all of 2020, he wore an astronaut costume. But this is a time where cosplay could thrive and, like, that's people true. could wear, like, superhero co I could be Black Panther. Yeah, that's pretty cool. With the weird face covering. <laughs> like, that's a good point. Yeah. You could pick a superhero costume and wear yeah, it every day. Yeah, I would, but I would probably cover myself up completely so that they couldn't affect me. Yeah. Um, there's always some build up because I noticed what I never taught elementary school is that little kids like to hug a lot mm -hmm. or like to come up to their teachers and like hug them or whatever. And I can't, I don't like that. Just a no touching policy. Type yeah. Of thing. yeah. Gotcha. No I do like, I need policy. that six foot radius. Yeah. 
Yeah. Something that I saw that uh, threw me was somebody sent their kid to school with like a Superman mask and the kid came home with a Spider-Man mask. Oh my God. <laughs> because their friend, they had like each other's they masks, traded. they traded masks. Oh no. Yeah. So uh, oh, a really very funny, specific though. like no trading masks. Yeah. <laughs> you had to really tie it to their face. Tie yeah. It to their face. <laughs> yeah. It to yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe I like I like a lot of the schools that are doing the uh, the half capacity so they can have yeah. more space. And then I know a lot of schools are doing like alternatives to recess. Yep. Because I think that's probably going to be one of your more dangerous spots. It, but the younger the kids outside, get, recess outside though, so it might be somewhat safer. Oh, but it's a lot of like touching though. That's yeah. true. Like think about what games like little kids play. You know, right. like, tag, Red Rover. Oh, send Jimmy. I, I ran out of. I ran out of, of games. They have like four square hoops and four square I love four and square anything too. touching with a ball. Hoop stick. <laughs> you can play, you can play yeah. like half court or yeah. I feel like you could do it, but you'd have to have like very specific. It might be specific. really disgusting for kids if everyone's like touching that ball. It would have to be a, a non-contact sport. Otherwise, yeah. like, you're, you know, yeah, you're outside, but if, if you're like super close. Just make them run in loops around the building until. Oh, that's a punishment. <laughs> no, like, All across country, look, I made at, my students do that. At recess, <laughs> you watch Bill Nye episodes, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. If you guys were thinking back to like when you were in school, like how do you think you would do in this like COVID era? Terribly. Think? Yeah. I would have thrived. Okay. Yeah? I'm, I'm not going to be cynical. I was like the kid. I don't like to do recess. I really? like to be with my books <laughs> and be left alone. This will be my moment because I was ready for this. I couldn't. <laughs> so like. I feel pretty safe in saying that. Like, I didn't like other people that much. I didn't like other kids. Hmm. So I would have been... Oh, God, now I feel like a weirdo. No, I no. Been, I, mean, I was totally... When I was in the high... I, I, I would totally be the person who has lunch with the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> like some sort of loon. I was very social. I would have very, I would have had a very hard time. Yeah, yeah. me too. To the point where, like, my, stu- my, my teachers would write back to my parents saying, like, get him under control. My, my, my <laughs> teachers will always be like, he was so well behaved. He was so quiet and blah, blah, blah. My parents would be like, what? what? Mm-hmm. It's like, who is this person you're talking about? Are you sure <laughs> you did not mistake the file? Because he comes home and screams at everybody all the time. Yeah. That's cool. I thrived. I hated people. <laughs> my age were terrible. That's funny. They were kind of disgusting. <laughs> I, I think the main takeaway, though, is just like, in my opinion, I think that it's one of the scariest things. That, like, I don't know. I think essential workers definitely, you know, deserve like some sort of award for having to do this all the time. But yeah. I think teachers is a specific type of hell where it's like it's the same kids with the same capacity for spreading germs every day and i i just i don't know so i don't that's, think our i mean it was always our system wasn't designed for this already but right. like you and i was a teacher there was like you have 28 students and 25 desks make it work yep <laughs> right like, right fortunately a lot of people were skipping class at a given moment or skipping school <laughs> to give it so it wouldn't usually work out but like thank god for truancy <laughs> yeah, yeah thank god because yeah. i have nowhere for you to sit you i read to sit at my desk you just sit on the windowsill <laughs> sit oh, on the man. heater that's awful <laughs> i read this other article we'll that was steal like a desk from the teacher across the hall who has her planning pe- actually, I, th- I think we literally did that we'd have a teacher with planning period and we literally just grab a desk from across the hall yeah that's hilarious I read this other article that said like teachers have to buy PPE with their own like cash. Yeah, buy everything with our money. We yeah, buy everything with our money anyway. Oh yeah, I mean they're already buying school supplies, that's that, crazy. which is more basic to yeah. yeah. Why, why, I, would, I, why would that be any different for you know? Because I'm, I'm not first, saying it's right. By no, the way, I remember my first yeah. semester. I remember going to Walmart almost every day at midnight. Mm-hmm. Because I, that was when I would wake up from sleep one um, to oh get God. school sleep supplies. One. <laughs> I would go from school about six o'clock. I would oh, I would accidentally fall asleep, wake up about midnight, go to, realize I needed something for school the next day, so I'd go to Walmart and get it because it was the only place that was open. And I'd fall back and sleep around two to wake up at five and get started again. Wow. Wow. I don't know why I wasn't dead. I was. When I, had a, I had a lot of energy when I was 22 that I do not have now. Yeah, I'm 24. I still got my energy. It's good. It's good energy. It, appreciate stop, it. Stop bragging. <laughs> Get some projects done now. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. This next question um, comes from um, Madison. And here we go. Hey, y'all. My name is Madison, but my students know me as Miss G. Um, I'm a high school history teacher, and the question that I have is, so I'm only 24 years old, and I'm wondering if it is too early for me to start thinking about, like, my will and estate planning. Um, But, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. 
Once again, I love Madison, Miss G. Her glasses, her hair, everything is fantastic. Yeah, on, that's on point. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Um, so, so Madison's twenty-four. She's a teacher. Should she start thinking about planning yes. now? Why? Um. Well, partly because there's two reasons. One, it's always good. You never know what will happen. Um. And if you don't make plans, someone will plan for you. Um. And also for her, it, for someone like her age, if she's single, whatever, it's it's gonna be very easy. So the the barrier to entry is very low. So it's good to kind of have that in place so that you have the peace of mind knowing that it's done. And it honestly would be very easy to do um, for someone in her position. Gotcha. Yeah, and it's good to kind of lay some groundwork for for what's going to happen later on down the road. So, like, if she gets married, has kids, buys a house, anything like that, you know, you kind of lay that groundwork when you're young, so you've got something in place, and then you just build on that. Yeah, as your assets and your life grows. Yes, I assume she has hopes and dreams. Yeah, I, I would assume. <laughs> Maybe she not. She seems like I've person who has life plans. <laughs> can you do... She, she can, can hold down do, a 9 to 5. Or I like guess like an 8 to 8. Whatever yeah, it is. yeah. Oof, God. Um, can you make like... We were talking the other day about Booleans, right? If-thens, right? If this happens, if I get married, then every, then he, yeah, yeah, my you spouse can, you gets... Yeah, you can have lots of things like that. Yeah. Gotcha. You can, you can pre-plan for things like like marriage and kids, because otherwise, if you if you don't do that, it'll actually like invalidate you, if, your will. Once you do get married, I would say redo you your will. Redo it. Yeah. Because uh, if you're, if it's written in anticipation of marriage, that's okay. But if you didn't do that, then you might want us want to update the tweak and be like, hey, I'm married now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the simpler you can make your estate plan and your will, the less expensive it will be to administer it down the road. Yeah, 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 exactly. And just getting everything in order. It, it, if she's thinking about it, that's like a little bit less mental space that, that has to occupy in her head. It's like, should you save for retirement now? Yeah, she should. Right. I mean, she mm-hmm. could start doing it in five years, but it'll just be more annoying. Right. Yeah. Um, do you think that it's important for teachers right now? To yes. You? And, and why? Is well, that? one of was always important. So they were, they were always at risk of something happening to them. Um, not well, like like everybody. Not, right, everybody not because is. teaching itself has some unique hazards, but usually most of them aren't lethal. Um, granted, the way schools are being run now, it's hard to say. But now with COVID in particular, in the way that they are like a social cross section, it's like you now every day you have a class of twenty five kids. So now you have those twenty five kids who met with their twenty five families and their contacts, right. and so now you've literally created a. Spider Petri web. Petri dish, a spider yeah, web, a one of those. Contract tracing <laughs> nightmare. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly like one of those CSI or what, and what, <laughs> when you draw the mm-hmm. web with the suspects <laughs> and things. Jimmy's uncle had COVID. And, and the, now you've made yeah. this poor person the middle part. Yep. Um, I mean, teachers have died of COVID, even elementary school teachers. I remember one in South Carolina recently who died from COVID-19. Um, it's You will feel bad. If you want, I, it's, they, should, they should almost give it to you as part of like your hazard package. But, um, but nonetheless, yeah, I would say, especially older teachers or people who are in higher risk groups should run to get their wills done. But even if you're a 24 year old, um, get it done because partly because of COVID, if it's not COVID, it'll be something else. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Cool. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I we're kind of lucky on pandemics. We haven't had too many in our lifetimes. This is actually we're actually kind of fortunate. That this is as lethal as like what was that Michael Crichton book? Uh, Andromeda Strain. Yeah, any yeah. of those like that. Yeah, we could have way worse things happening. Or uh, the stand by Stephen Maybe. King. Is, that, is it the stand? Maybe I, I, think, I, I feel bad because I love that book. It's one of my favorite not. books. Yeah, the stand by Stephen King. Yeah, that's got like a but, big. Pandemic Super flu. Yeah. Oh boy. So we never know. So, mm-hmm. but but if it does happen and it's contributed and it's spread by the air or touching, teachers will get it first. Um. So so one thing that you said, Stephen, is that everyone has a plan, even if they don't know it, yes. right? And we've talked about that before. So can you explain what that means a little bit? Oh yeah. So every state has a plan for what happens to your stuff when you die, um, without a will or without any planning. Um, but in most parts, it's distributing among family members. Um, so if you have like a long-term partner or anything like that, you're not married to, they're out, friends are out, anyone you care about is out, unless they happen to be your child, spouse, parent, or sibling. And even then it, but 
without having to, but I would say to most people, without having to know the details of that law, the way you can decide what happens is by getting a plan done. Right. So. Right. So, so basically, if you don't have a plan and you're super young and you do pass away, which would be awful in a tragedy, um, your stuff would kind of go to familial connections and the court yeah, would kind of decide. Exactly. And I know a lot of people who don't have kids or whatever, don't go to their parents and they think their parents are assholes. They don't want to. If, if you think that, then you want to do something different. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, this next one is a news headline. Um, so because teachers are kind of being forced to do distance learning, um, I think it's coming with some, uh, you know, unique sets of problems and learnings. My mother, uh, about 10 years ago, she really couldn't turn on a computer. <laughs> um, okay. and so okay. she's had to kind of learn at an accelerated pace because now she doesn't have an option and now she has to do distance learning. But um, there's, there's other problems too, or not problems, but there's other interesting headlines that come out of this. Um, so I wanted to read this guy to you guys and get your takes on this. Um, Gwinnett parents target teachers Black Lives Matter poster. School officials in Gwinnett County told the teacher that her Black Lives Matter poster was a disruption to the learning environment. She keeps it up because, um, in part because her child is LGBTQ. Um, Paige McGowey, McGowey, how would you say that? McGowey? McGowey. McGowey. <laughs> Paige McGowey, an eighth grade. If, um, Paige, if you're listening, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> Paige. Yeah, sorry, Paige. <laughs> no, it's okay. We're going we're gonna to cut it out. Here we go. Um, cool. <laughs> Paige McGowey, an eighth grade language arts teacher in Cruz Medi Middle School in Lawrenceville, um, placed a poster in her classroom late in, in late August. She wanted to show black lives. Um, I'm sorry. Whew. She wanted to show black students that she is an ally to the fight for racial justice, according to the AJC. Um, All children matter to me, she said. As the mother of a gay child, I wish more teachers had embraced my child's differences in school. If they had, middle school may have been a bit easier for my child. Two parents complained to the school's principal about the poster in the background of a video conference with students. The principal told McGowey about the complaints <clears throat> but did not ask her to take down the poster, according to a district spokesperson. Our employees do have the same civic responsibilities and privileges of any other citizen, including actively supporting causes, Gwinnett County Public Schools spokesperson Sloan Roach told Project Q Atlanta. However, that is not usually done in a workplace as it can become an effectiveness issue if it creates a disruption to the learning environment. Um, so yeah, I, I thought this was super interesting. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? Okay. So I used to briefly, I've been law school. I studied a lot of teacher stuff, but I, I briefly represented teachers. Um, but, um, in like employment cases. Um, so yeah. So the districts are not allowed to be like, I don't like your opinion. Take it. Well, so as they might, but they always will use the disruption in the classroom. That's like the magic words for saying, I don't like that. Yeah. Take yeah. it, get rid of it. And the disruption is in the eyes of the beholder. There's a very limited legal standard to what constitutes the disruption. And, um, because in real life, it probably did not disrupt the classroom until the no. parents made it a disruption. And then once you create the disruption, then you can lay the groundwork for having the thing removed or the teacher disciplined. Yeah. Um, but I like Black Lives Matter. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I agree. Props, if she needs to yeah. go fund me, I will chip in. Yeah. She can make more. She can probably raise more money on GoFundMe than she made last year. A Patreon, <laughs> yeah. Like very quickly. It's Wait, so depressing. Sorry. And did they did they tell her to take it down or no? Um, they didn't tell her to take it down. Okay. But like, they just really want her to. They want her. to. Well, okay. that was. I mean, that's that's what's like different. I, I think, wonder how this hit the news. Um, it, it's Project Q Atlanta. I think they look for stories relevant to this, and and they heard yeah. something Honestly, from the district. Like, do you think like the parents called the news? Do you think that the teacher called? I I would imagine I would the, the teacher news. did. If I'm the teacher, I, I would because yeah. I want to cover my butt when they try to fire me for exactly. something in yeah. isolation. Yeah, that's true. Part of me also wonders if the parents were like, they're not making her take it down. We're going to the news. And then the news <laughs> is like, uh, Do you know, yeah, she's you're like, not you, being reasonable. You sound like the jerk here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. so it's like, it makes for interesting content. I mean, I think it's super interesting content. Yeah. Um, like I, but teachers have been, they've tried to restrict teachers' behavior forever. Mm -hmm. There were, um, like story issues like teachers' personal lives. Um, they often would go after teachers for morals clauses if they did things that they didn't like, even if it didn't, even if the students never knew about it. Yeah. You're like, 
the fact that the, like what's an example like if it, well, like I mean, they used to have gay teachers in particular like in the set, like in the eighties it would be like yeah. you are gay you're disrupting your it, that ruins your effectiveness in the classroom yeah. even though we're not legally allowed to fire gay teachers we could fire you for being disruptive. No, I mean as someone who went to Catholic schools for my whole life that that came up. <laughs> More recently than the seventies, where you know a teacher, like if a teacher was out or was going to get married, right to their, to, and it was a same sex marriage, then the school would fire them and try to find some excuse to do it. And they were, and yeah, and private and religious things were entitled to much lower levels of protection. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure how the Supreme Court rulings actually impact that now. If you but, guys had to uh -huh. make a. Um, like a decision on, on how teachers deal, deal with religious things and like uh, and, and and I don't think Black Lives Matter should be a political stance but it kind of is you know it's a very like left leaning movement now which I think is stupid right it, it shouldn't be I've heard that argument too whatever um, but you know nowadays that's taken as a political affiliation um, right. I support Black Lives Matter it means you're on the left um, what do you guys think is the proper way for teachers to deal with that if you had a child and that child went to uh, a classroom and that teacher supported things that you didn't support, right? Let's say, I know Steven, you're very left leaning, right? So if, if the teacher was a Trump supporter and was like pretty much stuffing your kid, it was a world history class. He was stuffing your kid's want, head full of right wing propaganda. What would you, what would your opinion on I that be? I want, okay, I am going to take the opinion. I personally believe that teachers just state what they think. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's better just to have this out there and have the ruse that people are neutral actors. They aren't. Even when you're holding back your political opinions, you're still leaking your political opinions. Yeah, it's still like influencing your decisions. Like, just say it. Just put up the stupid sign. If you're very strongly leaning and you support, if you support Make America Great Again, let me know so I can make a decision about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So I could either remove my child from your classroom, or my child knows that you're an extremely biased actor. And they can take that in mind. But I don't want people to have this ruse of pretend neutrality when they aren't being neutral. Mm -hmm. No one's ever being neutral. I, <laughs> I, I told my students to vote. And I wasn't even subtle. My students, my students were seniors <laughs> in high school. I didn't tell them who to vote for. But everyone pretty much knew I was really on board with Barack Obama. It was not <laughs> – this was 2008. It was not subtle at all. I can't tell you who to vote for. But there was a black yeah. man running for president in this school's 99.7% black. <laughs> so I know there was a – Good way to edge around that, Stephen. We literally could – I feel so bad bad for the white kid in that school honestly <laughs> it's one of the few times i've been like the inverse of that white kid my whole life yeah it's like yeah. but yeah but just stop pretending we're neutral they're just people who are doing things as long right. as they aren't doing something that's illegal as long as they aren't advocating robbing banks or murdering people as a valid strategy mm -hmm. or like preparing giving your students advice to ammo for your bunker <laughs> then yeah. it's probably fine to yeah. me yeah, I mean, I guess my opinion would be, you know, you don't have to be perfectly neutral because nobody really is perfectly neutral. But at the same time, I would probably not be super stoked if a teacher was like pushing a specific candidate and that would be on, on either side of the of the yeah. spectrum. Because then I feel like at that point, it's almost one of those, you know, this is a person in a position of power who is kind of telling these people how to think. Right. Well, they and, are. and I'm not and I'm not saying, well, they are telling yeah, it's kind of what teaching is. Um, that, that's but, like caveat. No, you I know what's interesting. But, but my thing is, you know, it, it's it's one thing to talk about, you know, principles that you believe in, right? Like mm -hmm. that's great, mm -hmm. you know. But it, it, it's there's just like a line where it gets to be a little bit where it just makes me a little uncomfortable. But yeah. at the same time, like teachers are people. Teachers have opinions. They have a right to free speech. I, I, yeah. I would agree with that. I think it would get I mean, like, almost like the Hatch so, Act for federal employees. Like mm -hmm. we all know you you work for or uh, ex parties. Yeah. candidate we know you're a republican or a democrat right. but campaigning on school grounds is probably bad yeah. gotcha gotcha yeah. but everyone should know that i'm a bleeding heart liberal and if you don't yeah. like that note it yeah. <laughs> or you can move to the other english teacher down the hall who is more in alignment with your views mm -hmm. and we could and we could end this ruse of yeah. like pretending everyone's unbiased but yeah i would i would say it stops short of campaign posters i would and, agree and with i that. think it kind of comes down to as well like all right, what, like, what are we saying, and is it in line with with the principles of education? Not in terms of like, is I, I don't like when you cross that line. Like, is this in line with the principles of Catholic education? That's where you get in a lot of the homophobic stuff, right? Yeah. Um, you know, even though when you really dig into it, there's there's yeah, there's depth there. But um, 
I think what it comes down to is, is it compatible with what we're trying to, to do, which is to educate um, and a big part of that is, you know, teaching people about, you know, the people around them and how to be a good citizen and all this. So, like, if you're, if you're a big thing, it's like very like anti-science, right? Don't be like, a science teacher. Yeah, don't be a science teacher. But you should know that you you should know your science yeah. teacher's anti-science. You know, like so if, you can price it in. If, <laughs> if you're a history teacher and also a Holocaust denier, yeah, probably should. Bad find news. Out for don't you. do that. Should, That's no good. I, I should right? know that. Though, it needs to be kind are. of a. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, right. If you are, tell me who you are so so you're not just being sneaky about it. I think part of the difficulty is But I'm saying tell me so we can push to get you fired. Or shift. can we put Tintry Teat something else where we don't have a fundamental disagreement? Uh, Just go ahead. In Cobb County, we had like, after I left, we had had the sticker in our bio books telling me that it may or may not be true, more or less. (laughs) Really? Are you serious? uh That is mind-boggling. It happened for like, I think they took them out. Those are like, that's crazy. We can't endorse evolution or not. It's like, really, you can't? That's crazy. (laughs) <laughs> like I can endorse it because it's in the book you paid for. You bought the textbook. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yep. Um, I think part of the issue is that like d- someone who someone who denies the Holocaust doesn't self-identify as a Holocaust denier, right? They just think, oh, I I discovered the truth, right? And and mm-hmm. I think that like there's this like weird like this well, lack of self-awareness yeah. when you inherently believe these things, and you know you don't. I don't know. So it's mm-hmm. but anyway. But having said that, I think teachers are um among the more cosmopolitan people yes. not not intentionally but that's partly because they have a lot of different people talking to them all the time right so yeah, i think if any one mm-hmm. person is mm-hmm. inclined to be open-minded teachers my personal experience tend to be mm-hmm. even if they come at even if they have an ideology they're, they're not going to be like they tend not to be assholes about it yeah so that brings me to my next point here <laughs> um let me let me tell you a personal anecdote from my high school experience, and I want to, to hear your guys' opinions about oh this. Oh, boy. Okay? Here we go. All right. <laughs> it was a terrible day. No. Um, cool. I had this teacher. It was a, I think it was about 10th grade. Um, it was global history. And uh, the, have you guys played Call of Duty Modern Warfare? Yeah. No. It was like the iconic I've, I've, one. I've, I've played that. Version. I played Call of yeah. Duty. Or no, I'm War. sorry. Modern Warfare 2. And, and no. Okay, Modern Warfare 2 is one of the best Call of Duties, right? And so it had just come out. It was like, I don't know what year it was. It was like 2012. Oh I know. I, I, you're I, so I'm young. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I'm young. Uh, I'm, so I'm sorry. I'm young. I literally that was eight years ago. Come on. It was a long time ago. I was practicing um, law already. Sorry. Um, oh, no, no. I'm dating myself. Uh, anyway. I'm dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... That game was the best because they introduced this mechanic, right, where, like, you could have a crossbow, and on the crossbow bolt, you would fire it, and it would stick into the guy, and then it would explode, and it made you feel like you were the best gamer ever, man, and, like, because it, it was just this really, really great mechanic, really fun. I don't know. Okay. You guys... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah, I'm on board? I'm, I'm yeah. On this All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exploding <laughs> crossbow, really cool game. It sounds horrifying, but I'm on, I'm on board. Sure. And it was horrifying, but, you know, I mean, I don't know. You're a kid. You're a, You're a... 15 oh, no. year old boy it's like video oh no games, no it's right? fine my yeah. get it get it on the video games my my global yeah. teacher uh yeah. comes into the room and he goes who's played call of duty modern warfare 2 and i'm 15 and out of control so i'm like oh my god it's the best and i start freaking out and i'm like oh you can do the crossbow thing and you can kill the guys and oh my kd is so high man blah, blah, blah. Um, we had Mortal Kombat when I was a child. Yeah, it was not. It was not that graphic. <laughs> it, it thought it was. What? It was like Wolfenstein. Well, well, graphic, Kombat it was graphic was terrible. in the no, 90s. you can but you, you can could, rip someone's it, skull off and their spine stays attached. But, it was, but if you looked at it now, it looks so. Well, yeah, it's tame by terrible. now, but it doesn't mean it was. My tame. my teacher goes. <laughs> my teacher goes. Cool. I just got a call from someone in the army or something, or so, someone had just yeah. told me um, one of my former students just died in Afghanistan. And for the next 20 minutes, he like laid into me, Ooh. like in front of the room. And not, I mean, not like terribly, but like he basically was like, hey, like this is wrong. It's glorifying violence. I have a strong belief that like this is like this is indoctrination based on like the US government trying to prepare you and condition you to join the military. And it's propaganda and it's wrong and you should feel bad about it. Okay. So Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> that's a bad thing that that's your teacher bad, did. Okay. Yeah, I concur. <laughs> All those points he made are great points. Yeah, but, but that's a bad okay. way to no, do he it. Didn't, it. He didn't, didn't, need to he didn't be explicitly. Shamey. He didn't explicitly. I'm sure he shame. didn't end it, it with was, you should feel bad. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm exaggerating by far. But but yeah. what do you guys think about that situation? I mean, 
Well, he's right. And I mean, it, it <laughs> used to be you way know. more discreet, but now, like, the U.S. Army and Navy have their own esports teams. I was going to say, and like, and maybe these... 10 years ago, the Army mm. released a first person shooter that was specifically for recruitment purposes. Like, they, they've they always used stuff like this for recruitment. So, like, he's dead on, and it for sure glorifies violence. And yes. I say that as a consumer of video games like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah. I'm not a consumer of video games like that, not because I oppose it, because they've gotten too complicated. There's so many yeah. buttons to hit. That I <laughs> oh, I'm not. Work. I'm not good at them. I don't <laughs> yeah. play on. So, I don't play is, online. I get my butt kicked by 12 year olds. I have no moral judgment. I literally yeah. have dexterity issues. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, the, he, the teacher is right. Um, having said that, I don't know what that had to do with the lesson. Like right and <laughs> right and wrong means is what what I think on that, yeah. right? Like, if you want to have a chat about it, maybe you can say, like, a lot of you might have been playing this game, and, you know, here's some reality as opposed to being like, who does this? Yeah. I think the teacher might, next time they give that lecture, they might be like, fuck, I didn't know no one would be so excited. Yeah. <laughs> I really like, box myself. I didn't realize it would only be one kid. <laughs> I boxed yeah. myself into a corner on yeah. it. I think they assume that no one would like it, or they could just launch straight into their... As a teacher who's given many lessons that landed with a thud, <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like, fuck. And yep. that's just such a deep conversation too on like the link between video games and actual violence. And I am not. I'm not sold that. I am not. Well, I'm not part. I don't. That's not what I think. But right. I, I do think at a certain point, some of these military shooters are like a little bit propaganda on that like propaganda yeah. it side. It, it might normalize violence, but I don't think it makes people violent. No, <laughs> yeah. no, certainly not. I yeah. don't think so. I, I do. I, oops, I think it can play a role, right? Yeah. Like I think if if there's other stuff going on, and this is like you're like you consume a ton of this media, right? I think it could probably play a role, but there's no way like, in and keep, of itself that's it. The game's right? so compelling. You're probably playing that game instead of committing violence. <laughs> like, who tells them to sign up for the army when you have yeah. more video game to play? I mean, I know a ton of people that blow off steam by going and playing video games like that, and they've never done a violent thing in their lives. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Most of uh, most passive people I know who are getting into that, they're like mm -hmm. super into it. Like, Cut his head off! <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and I think that that's like, super interesting. I, eventually, we'll talk about that video games violence. You know, I think it's really... I mean, to actually create a, a data validated narrative of this is causal and this is why I mean that's such a difficult yeah. thing but to do but there are certain that, things like, that, and I feel bad for teachers there's a lot of things like school violence shootings stuff like that like things yeah, that you have crazy. to actually kind of work in in a way that doesn't terrify that isn't too political there's certain topics yeah. that are like I don't want you to shoot me in my at my place of work right. is a political opinion <laughs> stuff like that that's out there yeah also, yeah. I concur. I'd prefer if no one shot me in my office. Yeah, that'd be nice. Or please, anywhere. Yeah. Let's, let's, yeah. Please let's make refrain. that a policy. Yeah. Well, let's make I that mean, a modern estate planning policy. I do no have a, shooting. A, a fun, unrelated anecdote. It, yeah, it's related. So I actually, when I was in college, I was a psych minor for a little bit. And I participated in a study for extra credit. And they wouldn't tell you anything about the study when you showed up. You just had to go. And they have you sit down and they have you play a video game. And I'm playing it and it's like you have to... Like you're, like you're in a hospital and you have to heal sick people and you're like navigating this hospital and you're like healing sick people with like magic spells and you have to heal a certain number of people before the timer runs out and then that's it. And then they have you sit for a few minutes and then they have you do these like you have to answer questions, right? Mm -hmm. And they're open-ended questions. So one of them is like, you know, you get into a fender bender. The person ahead of you that you just rear-ended gets out of his car and starts yelling at you. What do you do in response? And I realized in that moment, and I was like a sophomore in college, I was like, oh, they're looking for the link between violent video games and violent thoughts. And I just was part of the pacifist video game control group. Yeah. And I wrote the most violent answer <laughs> oh my God. I could have thought of. <laughs> It was like, I'm getting out of my car with the chain that I keep in my center console. I'm going to I'm gonna crack him in the face before he gets, before he knows what's happening. And it was, and I remember thinking I was so funny. But, yeah. And then you put on a list somewhere. I'm somewhere sure, the yeah. Like, somewhere. Somewhere. These people lose their minds after helping somewhere, people. Somewhere in the Notre Dame psych in the psych archives at Hagger Hall, there is a little file that says, remember number 67 or whatever my number was. 
He's kidding. I, I wouldn't do it. Six, six, Notre seven. Dame's first confirmed true psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> that would be like, so 67, what car do you drive? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, Unrelated. What's the make, I model? I don't drive. I number. run everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so my to God. Avoid. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. In retrospect, I feel bad for messing up their study, but it was too fun. Most su- yeah. Oh God, I hate psych studies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's super funny. But anyway, cool. Um, yeah, no, I think I think I think kind of main takeaway is like number one, be but be upfront about like what you actually politically believe, right? Because there's no way around it, right? It's you have thoughts. Fun. You have thoughts. If you have no thoughts, that's awesome. There are some <laughs> teachers like I back. Some teachers I know have no political opinions. They are a blank mm-hmm. slate, which. Good for them. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I applaud people who could take in the data of the world and be a blank slate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it's honestly, it's a skill. Unsighted uh-huh. voters, that 2% of yep. people who still don't know who they're voting for, tip of the hat to them. Um, we're going to actually Vote go, from my side. We're going to go a little long in this episode. Okay. Um, we're going to do a full 90 minutes, and then we're going to use this content wow. for two weeks. I know, a full 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Whoa. Um, cool. Cool. We're going to talk about the movie. 21 Jump Street. Have you guys seen 21 Jump Street? I feel like the premise. Is that where the cops go into the high school? Yes. Because there are two versions. Yeah. There's like the newer version with the pe- with the guy from that. Channing Tatum and yeah. Jonah Hill. Yes. So I'm going to read the plot right yeah. here. Here we go. In 2005, scholarly student Morton Schmidt and popular underachieving jock Greg Janko miss their school prom. Several years later in 2012, the duo meet again at the police academy and become friends and partners on a bicycle patrol. Um, the duo, and they have to like ride these bikes. It's really solid. It's it's really good. Cool. It's really goofy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the duo is reassigned to a revived scheme from the 1980s. They basically like tackle this guy who ends up in a to be in a biker gang, and they catch him doing a crime. Except they forget to read him his Miranda rights, so he gets to walk free. Um, and they feel really bad, and the captain is like really mad with them, and so he's gonna put them on a special assignment. Um, to get that same person again? Uh, no, to get okay. a different mouth. <laughs> no. Because I think he'd see them coming the, this time. The, the biker was out of high school. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Like I think he'd see them coming at those Miranda rides. I, I, I think the biker had, had not done much in high school, so he was out. <laughs> Sorry, he was a drug dealer. Yeah. Um, the duo is reassigned to a revived scheme from the 1980s, which is where the original film takes place, um, which specializes in, in infiltrating high schools. Captain Dickerson assigns them to um, contain the spread of a synthetic co- um, drug called HFS, which stands for Holy Effing um, at Sagan High School. Uh, he gives them new identities and enrolls them as students, giving them class schedules and fitting their previous academic performances. Um, Jenko taking mostly arts and humanities and Schmidt taking mostly science classes. The duo mixes up their identities, however. Um, Schmidt gets to lead gets a lead on HFS from a classmate, um, and he and Jenko meet the school's main dealer, popular student Eric. Um, the two take the drug in front of him to maintain their cover. Um, <laughs> As one does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after experiencing... Cr- crack the- work. <laughs> <laughs> crack detective work. Good job. Uh, after experiencing the drug's effects, the duo discovers that Schmidt's intelligence now makes him popular, while Jenko's lax attitude is frowned upon, which I thought was one of the best parts of the movie, right? Because, like, in the 80s, like, yeah. the cool kids were like, uh, screw it, man, I don't care. But now the cool kids are like, so I'm going to this school and doing this and this and this. And That's like how I was in high school. Yeah. You'd be cool nowadays, was, Steven. God damn really cool. it. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, it's a nightmare to go back to high school. Um, cool. What does this have to do with estate planning? Well, my question is, if Eric... The high school's drug dealer in the film. There's there's some shootout scenes during some of these scenes um, of the film. Um, if Eric, the high school's drug dealer, was shot in the film um, and killed during one of the fight scenes, uh, could he have made an estate plan that willed his drug money to one of his favorite teachers? So, huh. typically, okay, so... Whatever money he has, he can will. But uh-huh. I think there's going to be a lot of other underlying civil there's actions gonna against the There's going to be a civil estate. asset forfeiture that I am sure will happen. What does yes. that mean in layman terms? So, <laughs> um, Ill-gotten gains yeah. the government can take. So basically, if this would happen to, return to, to it. this would happen to a lot of my clients when I was working in criminal defense, right? So if you get pulled over in a car and you have stuff that indicates you are selling drugs, right? And you have like a bunch of cash. They're gonna take that cash and they're gonna keep it, 
right? Sometimes we'll take your car too if they think that this car was purchased using that ill-gotten money. Gotcha. So anything that's that's gotten as a result of a crime, um, they can take. That they've lo- and it's super controversial. Yeah, the Supreme Court has tightened some of the compens the, the their takings of it, but nonetheless, you can. St- it, this still- is one of those across the aisle issues where okay. people on both sides of the spectrum think it's preposterous because. Um, you you don't have to actually convict the person of the crime to yes. take their stuff. Exactly. Because it's Yikes. done on a preponderance of the evidence basis, which is just barely over 50%, whereas criminal law is much higher. Yeah. So you'll hear all these stories of people who had a bunch of cash going to buy a car or going to, to deposit it somewhere even, and they get pulled over for something small, and then that cash gets confiscated because having that much cash is suspicious. Yes. And a it's a premise for police harassment of people in yes so a lot of departments depressingly use civil forfeiture for their budgets yes and then i mean i think didn't didn't some get caught doing kickback schemes yes where it was going to specific officers who made the seizures or even to like judges yes i believe that was a thing so the Um, supreme court has narrowed the ability to do it but it's still a thing and it's also something where the state is taking your stuff but you're not guaranteed the right to a lawyer yeah Mm -hmm. so you're usually you're typically entitled to due process before it's one takes i would have clients when i was a public defender asking me hey they're trying to take all my money can you help and i was not not allowed to help i couldn't touch it all that i could say is just you know make sure you respond you know you have to respond to that in yeah. writing because if you don't respond you can be held in default and then you just lose you don't have to go well, to a civil yeah. attorney because it's a whole different it's so just, yeah. because this person was being investigated by law enforcement and they had evidence that he was a drug dealer mm-hmm. right if if he's you know 16 17 and has 100 grand sitting around then it's a pretty short conclusion to realize that, you know, that's drug proceeds and right. then they're going to take that. Okay. Gotcha. So, but having said that, my state attorney hat. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> if, if, yeah. if they come to me the day before the shootout and without any disclosure, set up the right asset protection trust. I can probably do it. Fantastic. So that's have, my next yeah. question. It's mainly How do we do it? It's, it's premised on me not knowing that I'm participating in a crime or fraud. Okay. Yes. So keep your one of those things where I know like keep the doors with your communi- communi- with your attorney, keep that communication open. Shut yeah. that right off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so if you're a drug dealer, don't tell me. Okay. Good. I do have some disclosures and I will probably ask you to sign it or not a criminal origin. And as long as you're not, I'm going to assume you're not lying to me. Yeah. But, um, okay. And honestly, it it also varies because it could be a drug like marijuana that's legal in that state. Okay. Let's say they had a marijuana empire instead of this weird other drug. And it was Mm -hmm. like in Colorado or something where it was actually legal. And they, but because federal banking regulations, they can't deposit into a bank account and they were trying to shield it from and something that shoot out i can definitely help with that that's cool. if, but if the premise is violating both state and federal law then we're getting into a don't tell me about it but in theory <laughs> even if you didn't work with an estate attorney work with the right theory you, you want, want to park it in a asset protection state or if you're really aggressive like the, there's this famous ftc versus anderson case by famous i mean famous among like a group of attorneys um where they where these people anderson's committed this huge telemarketing fraud they put all of their money into cook islands um the government had this giant judgment against them tried to collect it they refused to give up the money from the cook islands they put them in jail for contempt of the order and the Supreme Court eventually ruled, you have to let them out after this amount of time because you can't hold someone in contempt for multiple years. So mm-hmm. they were just sitting there without their money. But what they could do was get on a plane, fly to the Cook Islands, and be reunited with their cash. So yep. you can do it. It depends on how willing you are to go to the mat to save <laughs> your money. If you have so much money, you'll go to jail for it. We can help. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Put the but, seal of approval on that. But I will not help yeah. you break the law, but if you yeah. no. break the law unbeknownst to me. Yeah. You'll do the, your job. Well, we the we can't assume that every client has broken the law. I assume right. no, no one. I, just, I don't assume I any ass- of my yeah. clients have broken the law until someone tells me they've broken the law. Right. <laughs> yeah. Until yeah. we're given reason to think otherwise. Right. You know, it's you. I think you have to assume people are 
at least coming to you honestly and reasonably. Yeah. The vast majority of asset protection that occurs is occurring in people who are like professionals in fields where they could be sued. They haven't been sued. That might be doctors who are right. afraid of a malpractice claim. Right. Gotcha. They might okay. be like certain things or you might own a lot of real estate and might be afraid there might be slip and falls or something on the property it might create a lot of liability. Mm -hmm. It's like reasonable stuff as yeah. opposed to I'm stealing money from the elderly and I'm really looking to hoard it. Could you, so two questions. Or I'm a drug kingpin and I really need to. I'm worried I'll die in a shootout at my high school it with might, undercover yes. cops. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> two questions. The first one, is there an age limit? Like, can you make an estate plan at 15 years old? Second question. Um, I forgot the second question. So the, yeah, the first well, one. We can answer the first one, yeah. yeah. You can have an estate plan, but you probably can't have a will in okay. most states because you're not old enough to contract yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could your parents set it up for you? No. No. Okay. Well, we're in this weird situation where your assets technically probably at some degree belong to your parents. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you can set up like a trust and things. It's not like a accounts. bank account. You can, set up, you, can, you can set up certain things like a bank account in your own name. I think. Yeah. Like, well, because there's a bank there are is. states. You can have a bank account as a, as a minor, obviously. Yeah, I think you have, um, to have a parent coast. Well, oh, but yeah, I know. Because <sighs> I don't think I could set up my, back when First Union existed. How old I was when my first bank account? I couldn't mm -hmm. set up on myself. My my mom had to co-sign on it. Gotcha. But I still yeah. have that account. Three bank mergers later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know that like some states have laws regarding what parents do with their kids' money. Uh, California, I know, has yes. one that's very strict because of child actors. Mm -hmm. um, to where you know. Because you have parents a, have a right to the money, yeah. you have to have a certain amount in trust, and the parent can only yeah. take X number of dollars. It's like a whole scheme. So, yeah. so it, that's yeah, I'll say that's very stated. But for the most part, you can have things other than a will, though. Mm. I don't even know you, but you might you probably have like some sort of. I don't know how much money these kids are making. I don't know how much YouTubers or dot coms or, <laughs> so, or Ryan Toys Reviews. Money. Ryan Toys Reviews was making like millions and millions of dollars. A month. Yeah. it's like fifteen million a month or something. Oh yeah, so crazy. we're like in that very unique situation. Um, what the parents would probably do is set up some sort of trust account for the benefit yeah. of the child or. Yes. Give them some sort of vesting interest in the business setup that they would it would revert to them when they turned eighteen or something. But you could you would do it as long as their parents aren't monsters. Um, it they would the parents would participate and make sure it went to the children. Gotcha. So you yeah. can do it, but you just need your parents' help, and probably it's going to be with mm -hmm. bank accounts and trust and that yes. sort of thing. It's based on it's having one non deadbeat parent. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which some people. Or, or sometimes you have a, some, sometimes you know what to state. That sometimes it doesn't have another another adult. Gotcha. Like a guardian. Deadbeat. So if you're like you're down to like your grandparent or like another or like your legal counsel or something. Your, your if you're guardian. A sixteen year old who can afford to pay me or an attorney. That's great. <laughs> we can set up a structure to shield your money from your deadbeat parents. Gotcha. Love With it. With one of their cons we have to just convince one of them to consent to it. Could you? Theoretically, wash money via the mechanism of estate planning. No, no. Well, you, okay, you, okay, you theoretically could. I won't participate in it. Gotcha. But you theoretically could. And, and but you can you can money launder through much easier ways than waiting for your death. <laughs> but we're not going to tell you how to do that. Yeah, because that would be bad. Is it something you? Yeah. Maybe Reddit knows. So if you're <laughs> thinking about laundering money, don't call why us. Do I think of, why do I think Reddit would have the best money laundering? I think it yeah. would. I think no, someone would. Give, would. There's definitely a subreddit somewhere about money laundering. Yes, there's. Yeah. I'm sure there is. Sure. But outsource that to people who are not ethically obliged to report crimes and frauds. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Okay, cool. Just thought I'd ask. Good Good to know. I, um, we're going to shift gears here a LinkedIn little bit. LinkedIn will also be good. You LinkedIn can for money, money laundering? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get get it someone like in Panama, Cook Island, someone who will like literally, not in America. They'll Fantastic. probably help you. I can't. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. So so this is our first little man on the street segment. I went out to Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia. I asked some people um, about some of their favorite teachers. Um, mm -hmm. Since this is the teacher episode, I, I interviewed some people about their favorite teachers, and let's go take a listen. Here we go. Cool, what's your name? Cool, what's your name? My name is Daughtry. My name is Diego Christian. Nicole. Leah. I'm Carl. Do you have a teacher that uh, you think impacted you? My sixth grade teacher, Elsie Turnbull. She used to always say, and still says, can't, has never done, and will never do anything. Anything that you put your mind to, you definitely will attain the goal. Mrs. Gober. She was my English teacher in, I think it was 10th or 11th grade. She fostered such amazing discussions and really created a safe space for us to, you know, have discussions and, and talk like adults, not like children. It, it was awesome. This teacher's name is Dr. John Kressler. He works at Georgia Tech 
Um, I took a class from him called Science, Engineering, and Religion in Interfaith Dialogue, and it taught us to understand other people's perspectives. Mrs. White, she was my first grade teacher. She was just awesome. She was the foundation to my knowledge. She made me excited to go to school because I was not happy to be in school. Yeah, why weren't you happy to be in first grade? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was more nervous than anything. Gotcha, so, gotcha. Yeah. Mr. Corrigan, uh, AP U.S. History teacher, he was just unbelievable at making primary research sources come alive. He always had you read the entire thing through, the fine print, and was really great at fostering discussion. Dr. Kressler is one of those teachers who genuinely cares about his students instead of just caring about their academic record, and so that's the main thing that I loved about him. He's actually become one of my mentors in spirituality and making big life decisions. Can you remember like a piece of advice that he might have given you? Always read the fine print. That <laughs> awesome. probably appeals to you guys as lawyers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. Not to limit my idea of who God is or like what the universe is. He taught me that and sort of guided us in that idea. Always speak up. <laughs> she really was like wanted to hear what we had to say and, and really fostered the confidence that we always had important things to say. Cool. Awesome. I love it. So yeah, I, the reason why I want to do that is like, I think that people, I think there's a perception or my, I, what my mom has told me is that Common Core and all of this bullshit that teachers have to like kind of do, which I, there should be standards, you know, but like at the same time, I think. Can they read a book? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that was my standard. No, really? There, there needs to be standards or else we're going to have people putting stickers in books saying this may or may not be true. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Right. But I think, yeah. I think from a regulation standpoint, right, I think a lot of like lawmakers and a lot of um, administrators want to say, hey, you know, the teacher's job is to drill this concrete here's a book of knowledge and the, the teacher's job is to spoon feed this knowledge into that thing and that's a child and that's what they're gonna do mm -hmm. right and i think that that's a very very limited way yeah. to view education and to view teachers um and i think that everyone has these experiences where it's like this teacher had a massive impact on my life they taught me more than just the content but they taught me how to live and be and they were my first real example because you're you're, you're, you're there's a very specific relationship that you have with your parents right and and it's not i think a relationship with a teacher is a lot more more of like closer to a peer relationship than than a parent right it's like it's, your first relationship with a professional right an adult mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. observe and be like that's how to act as a human in society instead of like my friends who are all being mean to each other and kicking each other <laughs> yeah um so yeah i don't know i wanted to throw it to you guys what are some of your favorite teacher memories uh of teachers that you had growing up i will premise this by saying i was a, when i was a teacher or we had literally our lesson plan broken down from the district day by day, and it was terrible. Really? So I kind of ignored it. <laughs> and as long as I think education, I think you're correct that um, schools should be about learning how to think, read, and write, and being a good person. And if you could do those things, education worked out for you. And if one of those things failed, you it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff, fortunately, we have Google or something now. All the actual information, you can find it. Um. But I am going to start with so my favorite i'm going to cop out of a particular teacher um, <laughs> but my my when i was in high school i went to the international baccalaureate um, magnet program at campbell high in smyrna they are awesome they're a lot of them are still teaching but like but in particular like some of my teachers are like I'm going to rattle some names off because uh, the ones who are particularly still teaching because if you have a kid in Cobb County, you need to like put get them there. Um, but like Betsy Bunty, my, one of my English teachers, she won a teaching award and she's amazing and she made me actually like American literature. Um, Ms. Romanchuk, who got me like British literature. I, I read Tessa Durville's for her and I hate that book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I still hate I, I, She got me to do something I absolutely despise. That sounds like a it great was person. experience that was awesome. And then um Miss Smith as well. Um she retired recently. She, her son was actually one of the students too and he was yeah, it, that was a really good dynamic that no one knew. Um or no one really knew. And then like Dr. Watermaker, my favorite history teacher, um Senor Roberson, who still teaches here, my Spanish teacher, who was honestly one of my worst grades, but she really taught me that a kind of endurance. And I think that, like, stick with it. She was like, 
she clearly knew I didn't like Spanish. I got a 54 in the summer assignment because I just stopped working on it. <laughs> <laughs> like, three assignment, I literally stopped on, like, page 8 of 20 or something like that. And so she generously bumped me up to a something. I could have cheated on this assignment and got a 100. I just didn't. She called my mom the first week of school. It was like, is your son... I, I don't know what the conversation went like. Is your son even interested? <laughs> was like, how is he... But by the end, she was, she was like kind of like urging me along to keep like going and finishing this thing. I clearly didn't like. Um, oh God, what else? Oh, Miss Yoder, who is also awesome. She was my math teacher, who was similarly problem was like, I hated math. I, and I'd be there was three tiers of math. The math studies was the level I was at, which was the lowest level. It was barely math in some degree. But she was also the urging along as like, Every day I'd go, I would go to her office after hours because I couldn't do relatively simple math. <laughs> I had lost confidence in my ability to do math because we were like, you can't do math, you can't do math. Yeah. And, and she kind of rebuilt that confidence for you a little bit? More or less. I could do, I still hate math, but yeah. I, do, I, I did it for two years. That's cool. Um, but I guess the kind of what I got from, I'm missing some people, so if I apologize, but I will probably plug you later. <laughs> um, but what I got really was that it was obviously like a college level curriculum the whole time, but it was like an environment where everyone was super gunning to be successful. And it, it wasn't that people, the teachers did not come to at a level of, I'm gonna inspire you to be great. I'm not, it's not one of those, like, well, was that stupid movie? There were many stupid teacher movies that happen where this miracle teacher is gonna come in and I'm gonna take these kids, I'm gonna whip, whip them, them into shape. shape. Yeah, wasn't that. I hate that. It's <laughs> so belittling to the students. What a teach. What I really respect about them in my high school teachers generally is like they walked in. I was like, "No, you're already good. So let's get cracking." Cool. It's like if I it, there's nothing more dismissive. There's nothing more empowering than someone just being like, "Oh no, you you can sit there. You can write a ten page essay right now by hand." We didn't have laptops back then. Oh boy. Like crack mm -hmm. out the paper, get writing. Yeah. And I don't know. That's the belief. The assumption, not that's the belief, but the assumption that you would be awesome. Yeah. Cool. And if you had a problem with that, then it was a problem with you. <laughs> it's like they were not like entertaining me. Yeah. Um, when Lance was a teacher and I was a teacher also, we would have like, we, we talked about edutainment where teachers felt this need to razzle and dazzle with songs and dances. Like Ron Clark Academy in Atlanta, whatever. He was this Sarah, this miracle teacher. I'm gonna make these students rap and clap and get them Ooh, excited yikes. about learning. Fuck you. Yeah. You know what will make people excited about learning is when you're excited about them learning. Right, right, and right. And you right, sit right. there and give the most boring lecture the driest lecture, but make it engaging because you actually care about material and you care about me learning it and you care about why it's important. Yeah. Like my favorite, Dr. Wanamaker, also Mr. Went, my econ teacher, they both taught their lessons <laughs> by slideshow. Yeah. It was literally like, here, I'm gonna talk to you for 90 minutes. And for some reason at the end, it was weirdly compelling. And I learned all of my world history and my economics. I think Mr. Went was a libertarian type economist, <laughs> but whatever. Eco also, a secret to econ is... E a lot of economists are, like, very libertarian, or, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. the econ teachers that I had, because they're like, yeah, the free market can do everything. And I'm like, going to cut off my ramble a second, but the, the secret to e getting a good grade in econ is take the answer that I believe is right and do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, what's the best way to solve this situation? And it's like, provide resources to them. No, that mu that must not be the right answer. Cut, <laughs> cut off the slackers. <laughs> it's like, a, a, it's like, yes. So whatever my liberal heart would want to do, I would just do the opposite of and justify it and I get there an A. Go. But, but honestly, with that bias, if you know your teacher's bias, then you... Can yeah, get you a good grade. You, you can manipulate it. Yeah. And then you still like walk away. It's like, I disagreed with that. Yeah. But even then they respected you my ability to disagree. Yeah. Anyway, but IB Magna program, awesome. I still have clients and stuff who have kids there <laughs> cool. and they will like brag about how great it was because it is great because they expect you to be great. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, as far as I go, I mean, I've been really lucky. I've always gone to like really good schools with great teachers. I think I can count all the way through law school um, I can count the number of bad teachers on one hand, right? Um, which I won't do right now on the podcast. <laughs> and I will say their names and their yeah, addresses. I'm well. not going to do that. <laughs> so when I was thinking about this, there's two that kind of stand out to me. I think each one is like a different aspect of one of those teachers that really does things right. 
Um, one is a college German professor that I had. I only had her for one semester, um, but she was so good at teaching and at making it fun, but then she followed up with her students. So, you know, every year she and her husband would have um, everybody, you know, all of her students that didn't, you know, didn't go home for Thanksgiving would have them all over to their house um for really? for dinner yeah That's and, really and cool. she would have you know people over all the time if she had two students that she thought would get along well she would introduce them to like you know try to spur the discussion and she was just huge on keeping track of her students and really just like cared i mean she was just passionate about it um so i had her for a class 12 years ago and she actually just reached out out no of the way. blue maybe like six months ago four months ago wow just saying like like, hey, I saw something and your name popped up, and I want, you know, just want to know how you're doing. And, That's so cool. And I'm not even sure how she got my email address. Yeah. Um, but, but it was so, like, welcome to get that. So that's, like, a teacher who just really cares, and you knew she cared. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, another person that was in the class with me that struggled in the class um, gave that same teacher a shout-out because, you know, she just really pushed him to do well. And then I guess my other one would be a fifth-grade teacher. So – kindergarten through fourth grade I just kind of coasted you know I just kind of did my thing and it was fine but the fifth grade teacher was so detail oriented like if you had to do a project that involved drawing something or writing something and it didn't have straight lines she would send it back so all of a sudden I'm getting all my projects sent back and I'm having to redo it and my parents have told me about stories are where I'm at the dining room table crying because I can't figure this out <laughs> and everything had been so easy up until this point right and she really taught me you know that that attention to detail and that you know that that, that matters and that you have to focus you have to do things right mm -hmm. so I think that's kind of like my two things when I think of like good teachers like one is passion and you really care about your students and and they both have both of these things by the way but each one kind of illustrates it a different way mm -hmm. and the other one is teaching you how to do something right it's not just like I can't tell you what I learned in fifth grade yeah, but yeah. I can tell you a you principle that I learned to apply to my life she taught right. you to the resilience to keep doing that exactly and you know that was the first and only time I ever got a detention was in fifth grade and it was for turning stuff in late because none of my prior teachers had really brought the hammer down yeah. and she did um and you know and i deserved it and yeah it was it was just great i have cool. a bad teacher story yeah <laughs> all right let's hear it <laughs> okay <laughs> okay sorry this is, it was not even my teacher okay okay so this is a story i'll get the light in um when i was a teacher my very i think i told you the story when i was a teacher my very first year it was in a school in Jackson, Mississippi, that will not be named, <laughs> even though everyone who knows me knows the name of it. Um, and the first few months of school, it was complete chaos, but that was, that was fine. Um, and I, the, at three o'clock, whenever the final bell rang one day, they were like, all the teachers go to the conference room immediately. Oh yeah, you told me about this. And then um, in the conference room, we sat there and it was like, I hate teacher staff meetings. They're always the worst. If you hate, if you love a teacher, know that they're sitting through the dumbest staff meetings. <laughs> um, but the principal came out and she said, don't talk to the news. And everyone's oh, like, about no. what? It's like, and there was like a long side. The principal didn't what to say. It's like one of our teachers was arrested for selling drugs. <laughs> oh <laughs> and, no! And then literally, I was counting down on my thing. It's like which teacher? What? Everyone's looking around the room. Who's missing? <laughs> who's missing? <laughs> who's who's wearing an orange jumpsuit? <laughs> <laughs> and, then I could, and then I personally know on my head at least four teachers who had drugs with them. <laughs> it was like God. It wasn't so and so. It wasn't him. <laughs> I think he gave my he gave my roommate, who was a teacher across the hall from me, drugs. <laughs> that was just marijuana, but it's it amazing. Was, it was just like it was like going oh, through no. all these drugs. Uh, it, it was like it was I I wasn't a loss. I and then later on, we found out it was an art teacher who had been selling drugs to. In, in the vicinity of the school, I, I say, please don't say two students. <laughs> yeah. I think it was the parents. That's fine. But it was the members of the community. Um, I, I eh. want to say it was crack, but like, I'm not a hundred percent sure. No longer sure. fine. Jesus, crack? He was selling crack. I think. Oh my don't, god! Don't hold me to that. Yeah. If someone who remembers this knows the drug, it's, I think it was cocaine or crack. But I might be mistaken. Wow. I used to That's know. That's bold. It. How do you how do you yeah. subtly bring that up? Oh, by the way, I, I am a crack dealer. I don't so know if like, there's something you'd be interested in. That was also <laughs> the lowest paid job. I'd ever had, so I could see why she might need to supplement her income. Yeah, okay. But it was always the art teacher. That's super depressing. That's super depressing. Start, if, if, just a, if the teacher's selling drugs, start with the art one and work out. Yeah. Well, really gosh. quick, I wanted to tell you guys about some of the teachers that I had. Um, 
when I think about these things, I do you guys ever read uh, like Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Outliers or whatever? I read. I've Outliers. read one of his books. I, I can't read, remember which one I read. I think I read David versus Goliath or whatever that thing okay. was too. Out, Outliers is about um, how people like become like experts at things, right? He's, you know, that's where the ten thousand hour rule comes yeah. from. Yeah. You invested ten thousand hours into the violin, and now you can play in the quincerto at the top of the thing and play at the Sydney Opera House and all that. That's very controversial. Yeah, the ten thousand it's, hour thing. Yeah, no, it yeah. doesn't. It doesn't. I mean. If I spent 10,000 hours playing football, I'm not going to make it to the NFL. Right. Same for basketball. I could not, I, yeah. I still don't have the defense to stop the well, LA Lakers. I think, <laughs> like, but. I think that the interpretations of the 10,000 hour rule are what's controversial. I think if you go back to the source material, serviceable. If, you, if you read the book, I think it's really interesting. I, and mm-hmm. he doesn't overstep in the book. Oh, no. I think, but no, I think yeah, it was like, I, it's like well, if I want to be able to make a half court shot. If I ten thousand hours into it, I could probably do. You that. could probably do that, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so the book is about. Um, he he looks at for outliers, right? He talks to them, he interviews them, and he talks. He asks, "Hey, what what do all these people have in common, right?" Um, and and almost every single one of them said, you know, the teacher that I had when I was young, like the, the concert pianist, right? Who are like amazing prodigy, amazing pianists. He's, they, they all say, when I had a teacher when I was young who made it a good experience for me, right? I enjoyed playing the piano, and so early on like the dopaminergic systems in your brain associate playing with the piano with releasing dopamine. Oh, and so, interesting. Yeah, and so you basically do it naturally and that's how you kind of oh. like unwind and I thought that was really cool. So when I think about teachers that I think really impacted me, I think about the ones that kind of started that like dopaminergic cycles for, for me. Um, so I think about my seventh grade teacher. Uh, at the time, her name was Miss LaRose, but since she got married, she, her name is Mrs. Stevens. Um, and she, I was like a wild Wild kid in middle school. I can't imagine. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> it's like even worse. Um, <laughs> and and so she's like, "Have you ever like done theater and stuff?" And I was like, uh, "No, but I got uh, whatever." And like she's like, and she ran the theater program, so like she like made me audition and all that, and she kind of like mm-hmm. you know kind of like stuffed me in a role, and I was like, it was great. Keep it busy. Um, yeah. And yeah. so so that was huge. Um, she always made that program really really great. Um, a couple years later in high school, uh, uh, Mrs. Hammond, um, like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so weird to talk about Mrs. Hammond now. Cause like, she was like literally one of my friends in high school. Like we were, we would spend so much time together. She ran the broadcast journalism club. Mm. Um, and so like basically we would do the news every day and we would make videos all the time. Um, and basically what I learned in that room was basically what I want to be like the foundation of my career, right? Which is like, hey, here's how to make videos and stuff. And and um, she was just super cool and always, but not super supportive almost, you know? Like she would definitely be like, she would be very real with you and like be like, oh, that's, that's uh, good. Like, yeah, no, it was. She was real. Yeah. She was teacher, real. I think teachers always make a mistake of being way too supportive. Like maybe there's yeah. an issue of like, oh, this is not good enough. <laughs> yeah. You could do better. Or, I guess that's it. Like knowing like that you can do better. That's that's my fifth grade teacher, right? Like, yeah. this is crap. You can do better. Go do better. Yeah. If, yeah. If I didn't believe someone could do better, I would tell them, this is, you're, you're <laughs> tapped out. Good, good try. Nice, yeah. <laughs> nice try. Which is not a great teacher attitude. <laughs> but give it a go. She would always like, she'd always like give me crap and be like, because I would never submit anything on time. And she'd always be like, no, you have this, this, and this. And like, yeah. So, yeah. That... Um, then uh, in my junior year, uh, I had a teacher named Mrs. Wheeler who, I mean, she was really, really great. Um, and But one thing that she said to me was like, we did this project where we were like, we were like deconstruct, deconstructing advertisements. And so like I did this presentation about um, this like McDonald's ad. And I was like, hey, th- th- like this is why they shot it this way. This is why these subjects are in here. This is the target market that they're trying to reach. And like it was like this big diversity play. And it was like it was it was back in like, you know, the early 2010s were like, I guess, you know, I'm wow, gonna, it's oh such a God. weird thing to say. <laughs> Stop Eight years telling ago. us we're old. Eight years ago. Get it. You know, when McDonald's. That was like though, yesterday. It was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, when McDonald's was like, hey, we don't sell poison. We are a community place where young millennials go to do work, like a Starbucks. That was, and, that was when they had McCafe's started. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Laugh very it was a McCafe hard. commercial. <laughs> and so I did this presentation. She was like, hey, that was great. And you should, like, you should like also, think about the, doing Nick this. McCafe is actually not that bad. It's actually kind of good. It is pretty good. It's really cheap. <laughs> yeah, too. McDonald's coffee is fine. Yeah. No, the, the fancy McDonald's coffee actually was like solid. Yeah. But I hated to admit it, their lattes and shit were actually good. Yeah. And it's like super cheap too. But <laughs> yeah, um, huh. she she basically told me like, hey, like 
you know, you should consider doing this as a career. And she said it just as like an offhand comment. It was nothing to her. And then like, it just, I felt like a lot of things aligned for me all at once. I was like, oh, okay. Like that sounds great. Let's do that. Um, so yeah. Anyway, those are some of my. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. But I think good teacher, I mean, I guess the two elements I was thinking about like a short memory when someone fucks up, they'll forget about yeah. it very quickly. Yep. Yeah. And often you teach, when I was a teacher, I had a short memory because I was sleep deprived. So I wouldn't <laughs> remember what happened yesterday. So someone like literally would tr- if someone like punched their classmate, I, I would have forgotten it occurred already. So I was like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> blank slate. But also yeah. like kind of belief in the person, not as they are, but as they should be. Yeah. At least I think it should be. The skills that, yeah, it's like they know you could do better. Um, so it's like, I am not grading you based on who you are today because who you are today might be a slacker. I'm going to grade you based on the actual hard worker I think you are. Yeah. Or the person, the skills, stuff like that. So, yeah. That's awesome. I Yeah, I think that that's kind of what makes for a great teacher, right? Someone who sees the potential as well as they acknowledge where you're currently at, but they also see the potential oh, yeah, where yeah. you could be. Like, yeah. I think that's really cool. They're yeah. not overwhelmed by it. They're like, mm-hmm. this is nothing. Right. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Let's Talk About Death and Taxes. Let's do some plugs. Um, if you would like an estate plan or you have estate planning questions or you've thought about it at all or you've listened to this episode and you're like, man, coronavirus is scary and I might die sometime soon, um, we would love to talk to you. So you can give us a call. Um, Steven, the number. Our number is 404-939-7562. Exactly. Um, you can also like message us on Facebook if you're watching this on Facebook or send us an email. Um, um, what's our email? Our email is info at modernestateplanning.com or, um, yeah, info yeah. at modernestateplanning.com. You can also visit modernestateplanning.com. There's a lot more info about what we do there. As a former teacher, um, I know that even in the best of times, teaching can be very stressful. And so right now with the pandemic, we want to make sure that to all the teachers who listen to us have access to the estate planning documents that they need to feel safe. And so uh, we're going to work with you to find a price point that works for you. Um, We are trying to help as many teachers as possible, especially in the Atlanta area. And so if you have any questions, comments, or concerns about wills, trusts, or estate planning, post a comment. We would love to help you. Um, We don't just offer wills and trusts, though. We offer a lot of other stuff. James, you want to talk about? Yeah, like Noah said, it's more than just wills. We also do things like advanced healthcare directives, HIPAA waivers for your loved ones, and, and other things that you can do as far as power of attorney to make sure that if something does happen, um, people are going to be able to help you out. So if you're not sure if it's something that we can help you with, give us a call or reach out. Uh, We really want to help and we'll do our best to do what we can. Sounds great, guys. Thanks so much for watching. If you know any teachers that you think could benefit from this, uh, post their tag them in the comments. That'd be fantastic. Guys, thanks for watching. Have a good one.